Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maxim from Mellanox, which was acquired by NVIDIA. And today we'll have such an educational topic, how to add AFXDP zero copy support to a NIC driver. So this is the agenda for today. First, we'll do a quick recap of AFXDP and the things that will be useful in this tutorial. And then goes the main part, well, I'll show you how to add AFXDP support into the driver. I'll be using code structure and snippets from the MLX5 driver, but I'm not going to dig into any hardware specific details. Um, I will finish with some extra stuff that is optional, but very good to have in the driver and describe possible challenges and things that I had to deal with when implementing AFXDP and MLX5, which was the second driver after Intel to support AFXDP. As this is a tutorial, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions on topic. Um, so before we start, I want to highlight the prerequisites for this tutorial. Um, your driver has to support XDP in the first place. And uh, just in case your driver doesn't support it, there is, an another, there is another tutorial about how to add XDP support. Um, you can check it out. And um, also you should have basic knowledge about AFXDP, the roles of UMEM, rings, descriptors, etc. Um, but don't worry, the driver doesn't have to deal with all that stuff because the kernel provides a convenient interface and hides most of the internals of AFXDP. So let's do a quick recap of AFXDP. Um, first, uh, here is the UMEM. It's the central structure of an AFXDP socket. It's a region of memory allocated by the application, and it's shared between the app, the driver, and the NIC. It's split into frames, each of which can store a single packet, either received or to be transmitted. And we have four rings, uh, which is for queues that store handles that point to the frames. To get the idea of how the rings work, let's look at the pair of the field and RX ring. The application puts uh, the descriptors of, uh, of empty frames into the field ring. This is a signal to the driver that it can put received data into those frames. And then, the driver will move the descriptor into the RX ring to make the application know that a packet was received. A symmetric process happens on the TX side. So this is a simplified picture because the UMEM can also be shared between multiple sockets. Uh, so there can be more than one RX and TX ring, but the kernel API completely hides it from the driver. So, um, the driver doesn't have to worry about it. Um, what's important to understand is that a UMEM is attached to a device queue. So the requests to open a or close a socket will contain a queue number. It's not just uh, that we uh, open an AFXDP socket just like a regular socket, but we need to specify the net device and the queue number. Uh, a reasonable question is, why do we need to do anything in the driver to support AFXDP? The answer is that it's, um, it's the only way we can achieve zero copy. Sorry, any question? No, okay. So, um, we need that because it's the only way that we can achieve zero copy all the way from the NIC to the application okay. and the back. FXDP is very flexible and it can work in absence of driver support. And even if the driver doesn't support XDP, 
but those fallbacks are slow. To get zero copy, the application and the driver must have some shared knowledge about placement of packets in memory, and FXDP is a framework that provides it. As I already mentioned, a good thing for the driver developer is that the kernel API is minimal and most of the stuff is hidden under the hood, so the driver doesn't have to worry about it. It gets even better over time. Um, for example, recently there was a, a refactoring series uh, by Bjorn from Intel that simplified the driver interface even further. So that's it for the recap. Let's move to the driver implementation. Any questions so far? Okay. So this slide uh, shows a short plan of what has to be done in the driver from, from the driver side. Step zero is of course to support XDP, which you should have at this point. And it won't be covered in this tutorial, but as I mentioned, uh, there is another tutorial uh, specifically for XDP. Uh, second thing is to implement NDOs used by the kernel to interact with the driver. These are used in the setup stage when a socket or crea is created or destroyed uh, and also for wake-ups, which will be covered later. Then, when an XSK, which means uh, XDP socket, um, when an XSK is attached to a queue number, the driver has to create a pair of queues for XSK data transfers. The methods to allocate those queues will be covered later. And when the setup stage is complete, it's time to implement the data path for the RX side, the driver will have to allocate buffers from the UMEM instead of its normal page allocation scheme. The TX side has to be handled in NAPI, and it includes not only completions, but also the actual transmissions. They, they will also happen uh, in NAPI context. Um, now I'd like to answer this question beforehand. Um, while it may be tempting to save some hardware and driver resources and reuse your existing queues as is for XSK, you shouldn't do so. Um, the XSK RX queue requires a different XDP memory model because the buffers are allocated from the UMEM instead of being dynamically allocated, for example, from a page pool. Um, this condition basically forces you to use a separate queue type. Um, and the, while you may try to reuse the XDPTX queue for XSK, having a separate queue for XSKTX is also a good idea. Consider a situation where an FXDP socket is closed and instantly reopened on the same channel. If a hardware queue is shared with, for example, XDPTX and it's not destroyed and recreated, the new socket may receive completions for packets from the old socket and it will mess things up. The driver will either have to flush the queue carefully, which may be problematic if other traffic is also using the same queue, or just have a separate queue and close Um, yeah, the host muted me for some reason. <laughs> so yeah, it's just easier to use a separate queue uh, and close it with the socket so that we don't need to do that complex flushing procedure. Okay. Here is all the API that we are going to use. But don't worry, we'll be using it step by step. You can later use the slide uh, as a reference, but no need to remember all those functions uh, right now. Let's begin with implementing NGO stubs. There are two NGOs in use, NGO BPF and NGO XSK wake up. The first one, will be used at setup stage 
And here we just handle the setup command and the actual implementation, oops, sorry, it's too early. Um, the actual implementation of the setup command will be shown later. Uh, here I use uh, VND as a vendor neutral prefix for the driver functions and uh, I replace uh, any hardware specific details with pseudocode or comments. Um, but you can also use the source code of MLX5 as a reference and you'll find the complete code of those functions prefixed with MLX5E instead of VND. Um, so the second NDO handles XSK wakeups. This is needed mainly for transmit that happens from NAPI. So the main point of this function is to schedule NAPI when the application has something to transmit. It can also be used to signal the driver that the fill ring has new frames in which incoming packets can be received. I will talk about it later. Um, this function should uh, schedule NAPI on the right CPU according to the affinity. And normally you need to use a hardware specific way to make the NIC pull an IRQ, uh, which will uh, in turn trigger our NAPI. Um, we call this function NAPI if scheduled mark missed uh, before as a shortcut if NAPI is already running. So in that case, we, we don't need to, um, to touch the hardware and uh, make it turn, make, make it pull the IRQ. Um, before triggering NAPI, the driver should make sure that the XDP program is set and XSK is actually enabled in the given queue. And this is basically it. This is all that is required from the wake up callback. This is the simplest function that is needed. So you can start with it when you implement the FXDP in your driver. Let's move on to the setup callback implementation. It's a good idea to split it into two functions, enable and disable XSK. The kernel guarantees you that it won't try to enable XSK multiple times, but you have to keep track of the status in the driver anyway. This is something that actually can be improved in the API, but um, like the current status is as is, you, you still need to track it yourself. Um, AFXDP sockets survive reset of queues, for example, if the interface is brought down and up or some configuration is changed, leading to creating a new set of queues. That means that you need to keep track which queues are XSK enabled, um, because when you, uh, when you reopen your queues, you have to know if, if that queue is XSK or not. There is a function that returns a pointer to the UMEM by QID, but it doesn't distinguish between zero copy and copy sockets. So you can't just use it. You need to store either a flag or a pointer to the UMEM per queue in some location that survives resetting the queues. Um, this way, when the driver recreates the queues, um, it can determine which of them are XSK enabled. So that's why it's important. Um, I see there are some messages in the chat. Let me quickly review it. Okay, some sound issues. Okay, so the question is, if you have a multicast listener, would you need to set up XSKTX? I'm fine with the subscription by normal socket. Um, not sure if I exactly get your question. Uh, you mean uh, that you want to only uh, receive data? Um, 
I'm not sure uh, how multicast relates uh, to it. Uh, yes, you can do um, multicast Rx uh, with XSK. Um, so is the question about uh, whether you need to uh, set up also the DX side when you don't need it? Can you unmute and explain? Yes. Okay. So um, basically, uh, I know it's possible to like. Um, I'm not ready to give you the exact answer. Um, I know it's intended to be possible uh, to create one-sided sockets, uh, like only TX or only RX. Um, but I'm not sure if it's fun if it's fully functional at this point. Uh, to be honest, I only experimented with uh, like two-sided sockets, but uh, you can actually try. Uh, there is some infrastructure in the kernel that uh, should support creating of a socket uh, without uh, like a TX queue or without an RX queue. Um, so um, as this technology is pretty new. Um, I expect there might be some bugs, um, but like actually, you have to try it out and maybe it just works for you. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Let's move on. Um, so, yeah, we are going on to the setup stage first, and this is the pseudocode of the XSK enable function. Um, you should validate the UMEM parameters if your hardware has uh, any related limitations. Then you should map the pages and don't forget to check the error code because um, like some functions like this one can return an error and of course I'm skipping it uh, for the sake of simplicity but you should uh, always check your return code and uh, do proper rollbacks. Um, okay, so then you mark then that the given queue is XSK enabled and the following actions depend on whether the NetDAV is up at the moment. If not, you have to validate the human parameters. For example, make sure that the frame size is compatible with the current MTU. When the interface comes up, you won't have a chance to fail. Um, so that's why you have to check it now. But if the interface is currently up, you also have to create the XSK queues and you are done. XSK disable is basically a reverse for enable. The driver has to tear down XSK queues if the interface is up uh, clear the flag and unmap the pages. Let's take a look at the flow when the interface was down when a socket was created. When the interface goes up, the driver has to create XSK queues for XSK enabled channels. We also get into this flow when the interface goes down and up uh, with some active AFXDP sockets or when some configuration changes. The implementation's details um, really depend on how you manage the queues in your driver, but the main idea is that you shouldn't forget to open XSK resources in, in this flow too, and uh, you can use the XDP get umem from QAD function to query the pointer to the umem. Let's dig into more details regarding creating XSK queues. While XSK TX queues don't require anything special, you should just configure them in a similar fashion to how you configure the XDP TX queues. Arc side is a bit more trickier. This snippet shows how to register the correct memory model for the XSK RX queue. Connect the XDP RXQ info to the UMEM with this function. And of course, you should handle possible errors. 
Now let's go over the key points in the XSK data path. Use XSK buff alloc to allocate buffers. It will return a pre-filled XDP buff structure. You should run XSK buff XDP get frame DMA to get the DMA address so that you'll be able to post a hardware descriptor. If you need to allocate a batch of buffers, there is also a function that you can use. It's XSK buff can alloc. It's mentioned in the summary slide in the beginning. Um, and you can use this function to check in advance if a given number of frames are available. The next stage is when the hardware receives a packet. NAPI gets triggered, you should run XSK buff DMA sync for CPU for DMA sync. Then you should run your XDP handling function as usual, but with one minor difference, which is anyway important. You shouldn't unmap your mem frames. You never want to unmap XSK frames while the socket is active. The next slide will have some instructions how to proceed after the XDP program return the code. So the first case is the main use case for XSK. It's when we redirect the incoming packet to the XSK application. No action is required from the driver side. XSK buff free should not be called in that case. The rule of thumb for the rest of the cases is that you need to call XSK buff free unless it's called for us. So on other successful XDP redirects, XSK buff free will be called for us. Still no action is needed. However, on errors, you should call it manually. XDP drop and XDP aborted require a manual call to XSK buff free in XDP TX, it's done for us by XDP convert buff to frame, which you call. Um, but if it fails itself, the driver must call XSK buff free by itself. XDP pass also requires a manual call, but first you need to actually allocate a new SKB and copy data to it because we want to reuse the UMAM page as soon as possible for the actual XSK RX. We don't want to use the UMAM memory to build SKBs on top of it for many reasons, especially because this memory is user writable and the kernel data path is not protected from external random data manipulations. And this is sample code for XDP pass, and it's actually that simple. You just allocate a new SKB and copy data to it. That's it. And remember to call XSK buff free afterwards. So this is actually uh, the real code, like the complete code that we have in the MLX5. It's really that simple. Uh, I just skipped uh, the increase in counter detail, which is also uh, a one-liner, but driver specific. Um, now let's switch to the TX side. XSK TX happens from NAPI, which is triggered by the wake up function, which in turn is triggered by a syscall from the user space. The application puts one or more frame descriptors into the TX ring and calls the driver that has to transmit them. It doesn't have to transmit all of them, it can stop in the middle. Running from NAPI ensures the right CPU affinity and guarantees no concurrency issues when accessing the TX queue. So, this is the code for TX data path in a loop while all packets are available, well, any packets are available. And while we have budget, we pick the descriptors with XSK UMAM consume TX. We get the DMA address and length. Uh, the, the length is just a field in the structure for the DMA address, so you have to call a function. We sync for the device 
and invoke a hardware specific routine to transmit the packet. So here you should put your hardware specific code. And there is also XSK buff row get data, which is similar to get DMA, but get data, just in case your driver needs to access the packet data. For example, MLX5 hardware in certain configurations requires the driver to inline the initial part of a packet into a descriptor. Though the API has changed since then, when I first started, I started implementing AFXDP in MLX5, this functionality was missing because most of the drivers don't really need it. And in the end of the loop, if any packets were transmitted, ring the doorbell, put your hardware specific code here and call XSK UMAM uh, consume TX done to sync the cached consumer index and the TX ring with the application. Okay, so this is the second part of the TX flow. It's handling completions. First, you pull the completions just as usual, no difference from the regular data path, but you count them. And in the end, all you need to do is to call XSK UMAM complete TX and pass this count. It will tell the application that the packets transmitted uh, before uh, that they were completed. So at this point, we are done with the main part. Uh, we will proceed with talking about some additional stuff and challenges. Um, let's start with the unaligned chunks extension. So normally the human frames come one after another and they are aligned to their size, which is a power of two. The unaligned chunks extension allows to lift this, li the, this limitation by, by setting a special flag in the app. If your driver can deal with such buffers, this extension is automatically supported. However, if you know that your hardware can't deal with it, you should check the flag and return an error on XSK attach. As far as I know, all XSK enabled in three drivers uh, support this feature. Another really great thing is need wake up. It's a feature that improves performance by avoiding unnecessary busy waiting, which may happen both on TX and DirectX. Uh, so consider the situation when the application stops refilling the fill ring and the driver cannot allocate buffers with XSK buff alloc. In this case, the driver has to pull the fill ring until the application finally puts something there, consuming 100% CPU. Need wake up provides a solution to this. On TX side, the driver can transmit only part of the packets from the TX ring. As I mentioned before, like when, uh, when, when we have a wake up, uh, we are free to stop in the middle of transmitting packets. The application doesn't have a good indication of how many packets were queued up, so it keeps pinging the driver with the syscalls until it receives all the completions, which may never happen in case of continuous traffic. So we'll have a flood of syscalls all the time. All these unnecessary context switches consume a significant part of CPU resources. And luckily, it can be solved by need wake up. And also, luckily, it's very easy to add need wake up functionality to your XSK enabled driver after you follow the previous steps and add basic support. Um, so for the RX side, you just need to call this function that is shown in this slide after posting hardware descriptors. If the fill ring didn't have enough frames, alloc error will be true. First of all, the function checks if the application supports need wake up. If not, we don't have any other option but reschedule NAPI and 
fall until there is something in the fill ring. But if the application does support need wake up, we need set a we will set a flag for the application with this function, and we will stop polling. We return false, which means we will not reschedule Nappy. When the application refills, oops, when the application refills the fill ring, it will see the flag, and uh, the flag in the application will mean that it has to trigger a wake up, issue a syscall. So we will wake up, get into the Nappy, and um, retry again, allocating frames. On the TX side, the flow is very similar. If the driver knows that the TX queue is not empty, it means that hardware completions will trigger Nappy anyway at some point, which will also transmit more XSK packets. So there is no need for the application to call the syscall. Under heavy traffic, this feature reduces the amount of wake-up syscalls from hundreds of thousands per second to only a few per second, which makes a huge difference. However, there is one thing I should highlight. There is a race condition, which luckily can be easily avoided by calling this update function twice, both before and after the transmit. So first time after polling completions and second time after doing the transmit in this order. So if you follow the, the order, you will not have any race condition. But let's take a deeper look at this race condition anyway and how the fix works. What can happen if we call the update function only after we transmit packets? It's shown in the table. The driver transmits all the packets and it's going to set need wake up to true, but the application queries it just before and we are in trouble. The application thinks that it doesn't have to call the wake up, but the driver won't do any more transmits on its own. It will wait for the wake up. That's why we have to set need wake up before we do the actual transmit. In this case, even if uh, even if the application queries it at false, the packets are already in the TX ring because the application should first put packets, then it queries need wake up, then it issues a syscall if need wake up is true. So the, the packets will be already in the TX ring and the driver will transmit them. In another situation, if the driver has already started transmitting, the flag will already be true and the application will wake up the driver properly. On the other hand, if the transmit function has put some packets into the hardware queue, we don't want need wake up to stay true without need. So we call we call the update function once again after transmitting to clear the flag as soon as we can when it's possible. So basically the first update call can transition the flag to true and the second one can uh, set it to false. Of course it will not happen every iteration but that's uh, what can happen at all. And after talking about the need wake up challenges, we smoothly go to other challenges such as the queue allocation scheme. Um, so in the beginning, um, i40e and the MLX5 had something in common before XSK. There are n channels. Each channel contains an RX and the TX queue for, norm for normal traffic and also some XDPT XQs. However, um, we decided to use a different queue allocation scheme in MLX5 rather than following the same for that was used in I4TE. In I4TE, when a socket is attached with a QAD X, the corresponding channel turns into an XSK channel which means that the buffer allocation happens from the UMAM. It depends on the application. 
and in Amulex 5, on, on the contrary, an additional pair of XSK, RX, and TXQs is opened in the same channel, uh, like an addition to the normal queues, uh, which continue to exist. We use a separate range of QIDs to distinguish between normal and XSK queues. For example, it's used in ETH tool to steer incoming traffic, and we need to distinguish uh, where we want to steer, either to XSK RQ or normal RQ. Um, a common XDP program used with AFXDP normally just redirects all the traffic from a given queue to the AFXDP application. And unless a separate queue range is used, RSS can also steer some normal traffic unrelated to AFXDP into the XSK enabled queue and mistakenly black hole in it in the application. With such an approach, uh, RSS has to be manually reconfigured by the administrator whenever an XSK is opened or closed. And we wanted to avoid this issue in MLX5. So with our approach, normal traffic can always use the whole range of channels. However, using a separate range for zero copy AFXDP sockets breaks the automatic fallback to copy mode in cases when zero copy is not supported by the driver. And um, we decided that RSS is more, is more important uh, that, that fallback, given that MLX5 supports zero copy. So we picked this way, but now you should have enough information that will allow you to pick what's best for your driver. And of course, the source code for both drivers is available for the reference. So at this point, I'd like to finish this presentation. Thank you. And I hope that now that you've watched this tutorial, you will be able to add AFXDP to your drivers easily. Feel free to ask questions. If you have any, I'm here to answer them. OK, I see a question. Um, how are fragmented packets put in? Uh, in the ring buffers. So if you mean uh, stuff like nonlinear packets, like nonlinear SKBs, then um, it's not supported by AFXDP. It's a limitation by design. AFXDP uh, only has frames and each frame is continuous and it holds one packet. So um, you don't have uh, an alternative to nonlinear SKBs with AFXDP. And uh, actually, with XDP either. And as AFXDP is based on XDP on the ARC side, so here comes this limitation. OK, so the next question is about uh, IOU ring. What UMAM does for XDP is similar to what IO Uring does. Is there any thought on this prevailing in the community? Um, well, to be honest, I heard of Uring. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it appeared uh, slightly after AFXDP, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and to be honest, I never touched Uring, so. Uh, I'm not competent to analyze uh, this topic. Um, I'm an AFXDP guy. So yeah, that's a good stuff that I should um, look at in my free time. But uh, like I can't really compare them at this moment, sorry. Jasper, probably you could answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, I don't like have an answer either. So, it's the, like, like you said, you uh, that uh, the IOU ring came after AFXDP. Uh, I hope someone would actually work on this and maybe do a model where we can also support the IOU ring. But I don't know enough about IOU ring to know if it's possible or not. Okay, so probably that's a good topic that we can analyze. Uh, 
in our free time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, so this link that you sent to the chat is uh, uh, regarding adding the need wake up feature. And they see that Magnus compares it. Uh, it's, he says that uh, the need wake up feature was inspired by IOU ring. So, yeah, probably the Intel guys uh, looked at it and took some advantage and moved to moved it to FXDP. Okay, so I see two questions. Uh, first one is about um, what do you think is the next development uh, with AFXDP improvements? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, we can move on with further simplifying uh, the driver API. Um, there was one thing that I mentioned uh, in the stock that can be improved. Uh, but uh, anyway, the Intel guys uh, did a great job recently on the refactoring uh, and the simplifying that interface. Um, the next uh, uh, thing that I know, uh, it, it wasn't mentioned in this talk, um, it's uh, sharing um, of the same UMAM between different net devices or different queues of the same net device which is useful for forwarding use cases uh, basically the serious ones on the mailing list i think it was already merged uh, but anyway this feature is ready um, from my side i don't have anything any new ideas if anyone has it's a great opportunity to share and uh, probably there will be some great ideas that can be implemented that's basically the answer uh, the second question i see is um, about the challenges of fxdp with non-linear buffers so basically the main challenge is that XDP doesn't work with nonlinear, and uh, uh, AFXDP uses XDP for the RX side. It bases on it. It's kind of fundamental limitation of AFXDP. Um, of course, with some decent amount of work, it could be um, added. Uh, because there is nothing that prevents us from extending the API. And uh, like, if you just, uh, well, you need a more advanced allocator for that uh, to allocate uh, arbitrary buffers from the UMAM. You also need to um extend the descriptors to store like multiple pointers to the chunks and uh, it's not impossible to implement but uh, it's quite a big amount of work and i'm not sure that it's actually needed for the afxdp scenarios okay next question is about arm 64 on ARM64 with SMMU, IO, MMU, and action, having multiple small size becomes an overhead with respect mapping and mapping. So in some drivers, we support coalescing of TX buffers. Not sure if this could be done with human buffs. Um, so for IFXDP, you do uh, the mapping only once in the beginning, you set up a bidirectional mapping uh, for the whole UMEM, and uh, then all the allocations will be done from that UMEM, and you don't have to map on a map uh, per packet. So I don't think it, it's, it's a problem with the FXDP. Okay, um, I hope you answer, I, I hope I answered the previous question. Uh, if not, please uh, elaborate more. Um, 
the next one is could you list some real practical scenarios of using AFXDP, which you saw in production environment? Um, well, unfortunately, I don't think I can talk about it. Do we have some performance improvement numbers in percents with AFXDP? Um, yes, actually, uh, it's a matter of packet rate, uh, basically, and uh, I'm not ready to tell you any exact numbers right now because it all depends on uh, the setup on your CPU and uh, uh, the NIC that you're using. Um, you can actually find performance numbers on the mailing lists uh, with the corresponding commits. Um, usually uh, when we uh, do performance related stuff such as uh, IFXDP, uh, we put performance numbers into the commit message. So you can find it there, uh, some, some numbers with uh, uh, packets per second indications. And uh, of course, you'll also have a performance improvement uh, for uh, having zero copy. Um, you actually can use zero copy even in such ways that you receive some packet, modify it in place, and then re retransmit back from the same memory. So it's never copied uh, on this, uh, like uh, in this pipeline. So a good, uh, uh, a good real user usage example could be uh, forwarding scenarios or some proxies. Um, but unfortunately, as I said before, I can't list any uh, real like names, customers and uh, that use it in production. Um, I believe it's confidential. Um, okay, more questions. If all of your channels in a NIC go to a new XDP only channel, does this limitation mean that only one application can be used per NIC or am I misunderstanding that part of creating the NIC use? So, okay, let's say you have, um, like, like f first of all, of course, um, it's not limited to only one application. Uh, and it's uh, uh, it doesn't break the regular traffic. Um, of course, you can have only one XDP program per the interface. Um, that means that uh, if you have multiple application, they have to collaborate uh, regarding the XDP program. Uh, because only one can be set and uh, of course it's possible to write a program that will satisfy uh, both applications or many applications um, but uh, it's not uh, something that happens uh, in the kernel automatically so that's some bottleneck regarding multiple afxdp applications uh, regarding channels there is no problem um, because um, when you open an IFXDP socket, you pick only one channel and the channel will be used by a newly created IFXDP socket. So um, it doesn't occupy the whole device and another IFXDP application can use another uh, channel or multiple channels. So yeah, I hope it's clear now, thanks. Uh, the second question is what's the difference between a copy and zero copy operation from the user side? Uh, well, it's meant to be uh, transparent. Uh, so the default mode is um, when you don't specify uh, your preferences and you will get zero copy when possible um, and uh, it will fall back to copy when, when non-possible. Um, but like there is one caveat um, regarding this slide, Q allocation scheme. So if you go I40E way, this fallback will work. 
so basically you will run an application and it will fall back to copy on uh, nicks that don't support zero copy and it will use zero copy on those that does that does that do support it um, but uh, this approach has RSS broken. So we, uh, in in Mellanox, we picked another way, and uh, this fallback uh, doesn't work just as is. Uh, so that may be a difference for the user. And of course, you have uh, uh, you have uh, a flag that you can set when creating a socket. You can prefer copy or prefer zero copy. In this way, you will like uh, you will get an error if, if you want zero copy and it's not supported, and if you want copy, you will always get copy. So, uh, but yeah, in general, there is this fallback to copy for compatibility. Um, next question: You uh, may shared with all queues. Is that true? No, it's not true. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think the uh, the remaining part of the question uh, is not actual. We yes, we use umem per queue. That's how it happens. And uh, like with the recent work, you can share umem with multiple queues or even between net devices. But by default, you get a new umem per queue. Okay, I see a question regarding the NICs um, you can play with for some learning. So, uh, yeah, of course, I can suggest uh, Mellanox NICs. Uh, basically, uh, ConnectX5 and newer support AFXDP. Um, you can play with them, and uh, also you can use Intel NICs. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't know the article names, but anything that runs i40e driver, ixgb, or ice, uh, all that stuff should support AFXDP. Um, are you aware of any applications using AFXDP? Um, yes, I am, uh, but I believe I cannot talk about real world examples and customers uh, because I believe it's confidential. Yeah, and of course, I should mention that um, if you want to play around with FXDP, there is a sample in, uh, in the kernel sources directory, it's called XDP SOC, and basically it allows you to test the different modes, RX, DX, uh, forwarding. You can play with that as an example application if you are developing your own one or if you are just exploring AFXDP. Um, so next question is, uh, is there any difference in performance on tiny packets when switching to AFXDP or is performance exactly the same? Um, so if you mean compared to uh, the regular um, kernel data path, then yes, there is difference. Again, I'm not ready to give you some exact numbers. Uh, oh, okay, compared to ordinary XDP. Um, well, I'm not sure we explored it uh, enough. Um, I expect that it could be comparably the same, uh, but uh, IFXDP could be slower because uh, it involves uh, like more code, more entities, and some user user land part. Um, but like it's actually pretty easy to compare. Uh, if you run, uh, you, you even can use uh, the kernel samples 
for XDP forwarding, for example, and for AFXDP, you can use XDP SOC minus L and compare yourself. I don't have any uh, good numbers to, to tell right now, sorry. Well, one thing I know for sure is that XDP drop uh, is much faster than uh, than what XDP SOC does for uh, the receive and drop mode, like a few times. Uh, could you just uh, repeat that one more time? So XDP drop is faster than which one? Uh, yeah, if you just run plain XDP drop, so you drop the packets uh, like at the very very early point and uh, they enter the XDP application, uh, it will be faster than if you run uh, AF XDP application XDP SOC, uh, which is a, a sample shipped with the kernel and uh, configure it to just drop uh, incoming packets. And uh, it's expectable because uh, with XDP drop, you just drop the packets as soon as they arrive. And with AFXDP, you need to move uh, around descriptors. You have some part in the user space. Um, and uh, only after all that code runs, you drop a packet. So yeah, it's, it's faster than the kernel stack, but slower than XDP. Okay, next question. The application of FXDP in your case is meant for real deployment or the work you are doing is just meant to prototype? Um, not sure what you mean by my case. In my case, I was the developer who added FXDP zero copy support to the Mellanox driver and uh, it's uh, meant for real deployment of course it's a uh, full-blown support in the driver and can be used in production um, regarding the xdp soc sample that i mentioned it's just an example application uh, that uh, uh, was developed by intel and the uh, xdp soc is meant to be uh, for testing purposes and uh, to like just as a uh, example, how a FXDP application looks like. So if you're developing an application, you are going to write your own. Okay, any tips for migrating from DPDK, libbpfs API is slightly different. Um, well, yeah, I expect it to be different. Unfortunately, um, I'm not familiar with the BTK API. I don't know how it looks like. So, uh, but I guess this question could be um, like a topic for a whole talk uh, by someone who has experience with both technologies. So yeah, unfortunately I don't have any tips for you. Regarding DPDK, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not an expert as I said, but I know that uh, there is a DPDK driver that uses uh, AFXDP, uh, so it basically allows you to use DPDK over AFXDP. So, so this might be a bit of a silly question: Is um, AF um, is AF zero copy a component of AFXDP, or are they uh, distinct uh, te te uh, technologies? How do they kind of work together? Okay, so basically, AFXDP is meant to be used with zero copy. Um, uh, AF actually stands for address family. This is what you specify in your uh, socket syscall, like AF Unix, and this is AF XDP. Um, so uh, zero copy is the main intended mode of using AF XDP because it's the fastest. Um, but the good thing about AF XDP is that it's uh, compatible with drivers that do not support this functionality. So there is first fallback uh, to copy mode if your driver supports XDP 
uh, but doesn't support zero copy for AFXDP, the kernel will do uh, the job uh, for the driver. And uh, uh, yeah, of course, there will be a copy involved, but the application API will be the same. Um, and another mode is uh, for the drivers that do not support XDP, uh, they will pass SKB to the kernel and uh, it will run XDP over them and uh, it can also run AFXDP. So basically, yes, AFXDP is a framework that is intended to be used with zero copy. All the rest is just uh, some fallbacks for incompatible drivers. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I see there have been no questions for the last few minutes. Uh, thank you all of you who asked me questions. It was really nice to, to speak to you. <laughs>